So as we look here in this verse, it's in Philippians chapter 4. Um, it's kind of important that we kind of see the, the context of this. Um, as I was kind of looking and reflecting about what to share um, with our, our body and with the members, um, I think we're still all still stemming from or dealing with the plagues of our, uh, our pandemic. And looking at how this pandemic has affected society and culture uh, in the economic world, we see things that just definitely been affected and uh, our economic system just kind of turned around. Even as an educator myself, um, often myself with principals and other educators, we speak of how this has affected even our instruction for our children and how it may have some impact in years to come and the significance of that and how, you know, that just kind of, kind of weighs on us at times in terms of our education level. Uh, even our home and family life, we see different things in terms of domestic situations that have occurred and even the stats have showed that domestic violence has even increased during the time of this pandemic. Uh, and of course, the health concerns that we see ongoing all around us. I, I remember when uh, Pam and I were traveling to a conference in, um, in January earlier this year, and uh, we were coming back from the conference, we were in the airport, and we saw these people, uh, I think they came from, came from um, Asian descent, and we saw them in the airport with masks on. And we were like, what's wrong with them? Like, what? Oh, that's that thing over, yeah, in China. that's that thing over there in China. I said, man, don't they know that? What's wrong with them? And now seeing where we were from January until now, and we're all just, uh, our whole lives have been really shifted and changed um, by this pandemic. And so just how, how we look at health very differently, and even one thing I've really noticed a lot, even at our school, is the mental health, and the effect of this upon people's um, psyche, mental health, and even our, many of our kids, we have a number of counselors at our school who are working with students who are dealing with a lot more things because of how this pandemic has affected them and their social emotional um, health. And so, we really see just uh, a, a really s a significant impact that's taking place from uh, the pandemic, of course. And miss the scenes of this situation, it seems like there's, it seems like it's a chaotic world for many people right now. And in the midst of chaos, there are people who are looking for peace and looking for hope. And in this particular passage in Philippians 4, 4 through 9, when we read this right now, um, Paul's speaking to a group of people who had a similar situation in terms of uh, worry and concerns that they are dealing with as well. So let's dig into the scriptures right now. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And it says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So we see this writing here, the Apostle Paul, and it's important that we look at the context of Paul when he's writing this and who he's writing to and really why he's writing this. So this is one of Paul's epistles where he's writing actually why he's in prison. He's in chains. He's been held captive because his preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's not in the most pleasant of situations right now, okay? Okay. Um, and he's encouraging a church that he planted um, previously. And remember the story in the book of Acts how Paul and Silas were in jail and uh, the, the earth, they were praying and, and singing and the earth shook and the jail was released. And they're about to, they could have left and escaped, but they didn't. And this jailer, the Philippian jailer is there saying, you know what, let me just kill myself now because Rome, Rome doesn't play. And these prisoners leave, I'm done. And they stop him. And they say, no, we're here. And he, at that moment, received Christ. And he brought people to his home to receive Christ also as well. And so you see the beginnings of how this Philippian church that, that Paul really began um, previously. He's coming back now. He's ministering to them. He's teaching them. He's instructing them. And he's telling them, hey, you know what? There's some things you need to do in terms of as a body of Christ, as believers in Christ. And you're going to face some things also as well. Because during this time period, the church is beginning to face some persecution. Um, because of their faith in Christ, people didn't really mind them actually worshiping Jesus Christ, but they were concerned with them not worshiping the local gods and worshiping the emperor. Uh, during the Roman times, you were worshiping the emperor as if he were a god and local gods of the community. So 
as Christians knew that Jesus Christ was the only uh, way to God the Father, uh, they kind of excluded these other gods that other community people worship. And so they always were kind of uh, looking at them kind of funny. And they kind of said, you know, if something happens to us, it's y'all fault. Because y'all not worshiping the God that we serve. And so they had to deal with things in the political realm, in the social realm, uh, whether it was the employment, or not having the same kind of business opportunities. And so he had to address them, hey, listen, you're going through some difficult times right now. You're going through some of the same persecutions that I've gone through. So I'm going to get these words to minister to you as a church who's growing in Christ. And he also had to minister to them in terms of conflicts within the church. Uh, there's some things he had addressed to them in terms of unity and coming together and being one and working in one accord. And the church also sent a, a, a local minister named Epaphroditus to come and minister to Paul. But this guy, as he comes to minister to them, he gets sick and ill, and he almost dies himself trying to minister to Paul. And so he's dealing with various issues here with the church, and he writes his letter to them to encourage them, to instruct them, and to help them. And he tells them this, and this is one thing he has throughout. No matter what's going on, rejoice. No matter what you're going through, no matter what circumstances you have to deal with, remember to rejoice. And he wraps up this letter, and this latter part we're seeing in chapter 4, he's telling them, listen, be filled with joy and be filled with peace and to live in peace. So that's where we see this particular part of the, of the letter he's written to the church of Philippi. And so let's look at um, the first verse of this in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 and 5. In our, the pursuit of peace, he tells them this particular instruction first. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So the first point we take a look at is rejoicing in the Lord continuously and unconditionally. Rejoicing in the Lord continuously and unconditionally, which is not always easy. Um, now, as we see here, and I shared with you earlier, there's an ongoing theme of joy and rejoice in this. Um, the word joy occurs five times in this particular book that Paul writes, more than any of his other books. And the word rejoice occurs in eight different occurrences. And he tells them time and time and time again. And even in Philippians chapter 3, he tells them, listen, I'm telling you guys to rejoice, and there's no problem for me to tell you again and again. You may be tired of hearing it, but I'm going to keep giving it to you. Keep on rejoicing. I know what you're facing. I know what you're dealing with, and you know what I'm dealing with right now. I'm still going to give you this word, keep on rejoicing. Keep on rejoicing. And so a part of their pursuit for peace, Paul tells them, make sure you continue to rejoice. Now, if you look at Paul, and we mentioned earlier, Someone looking to him saying, listen, Paul, you're writing this letter to the Philippian church, but how can you say rejoice? I mean, look at your situation. First off, man, <laughs> you're in jail. Like, like, you're in the big house, right? And so you can't go nowhere. You can't do anything. You're in jail um, because of, of your faith, because of the very same thing you're preaching now. You see your church is now also starting to come through persecution as well, and they're facing some hardships. They're facing some difficult times. And then... Even though you uh, initiated this church, you're now seeing there's some internal conflicts. There's some personalities in the church that are clashing. Does that happen in church? Hmm. Yeah, that happens. So some people don't quite see things the same way. And some things that he has to address with them being on unity and one accord. And even calls out to the members and says, listen, you guys need to get together and work together to resolve this. And then, of course, his friend and companion, Epaphroditus, almost just checks out. He's here to minister to Paul, and he himself comes to the point where he's almost sick to death. And so when Paul says rejoice, he's like, Paul, are you out of your mind? How can you look at all that's going on and say rejoice in all these situations? But Paul kind of clarifies this. He says this, our rejoicing is not about the hardship or suffering. He's not rejoicing about that. He's not rejoicing that he's in jail. He's not rejoicing that the church is going through persecution. But his rejoicing is in the Lord. His rejoicing is in the Lord. And we rejoice in the Lord while we deal with these hardships. It doesn't matter what our current or external situations are. There are internal truths that always will be true no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're dealing with. These eternal things will never change. One, and very simple, is this. I myself know I'm a sinner saved by grace. I know the things that I've done. I know the things that I've thought. I know the things that I've said. And so I know that, you know what, I see all these things. I see all that God has to see, nothing I can hide from him. And he still says, Bobby, I still called you, and I'm going to save you. And the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his own love toward us, even while we were still yet sinners, even while we were still doing our own thing, having our own way, God says, you know what, I'm still going to send my best, Jesus Christ, on this earth to die for you. 
I can rejoice in that. Nothing in my external circumstance can change that. I am a sinner saved by grace. Don't deserve it. If it was me and I was God, I'd say, uh-uh. But he says, you know what? I love you. My grace is sufficient for you. And so, one, I'm a sinner since, um, who is, who's saved by grace. Two, the Lord who saved me said he'll always be with me. He says, Bobby, you know what? Now I'm going to save you, but I'm going to adopt you to be a part of my very own family. And I'm going to love you. And I'm going to teach you. And I'm going to incorrect you. I'm going to instruct you. And I'm never going to leave you. And I'm never going to forsake you. I will always be with you. Now, there may be times where you go some difficult situations, but in the valley and in the mountain peak, I'm always with you. My circumstances, my situations will never change. The fact that my Father in heaven says he'll always be with me no matter where I'm at. That doesn't change. And he also tells me this as well, that no matter what I face here upon this earth, it's not my home. I have a home waiting for me, an eternal citizenship in heaven. And Paul mentions that even to this church, that our citizenship is not here upon this earth. And as much as the things on this earth right here weigh us down, ultimately, ultimately, my home in heaven can never be taken away. They can take away my house here upon this earth. They can foreclose upon it and take it. Or something can come and, and destroy it. But nothing will take away from the fact that I have a home, an eternal home, an eternal uh, destination to be with God someday in heaven. And so there's some things that even though externally around us may be going topsy-turvy, maybe going crazy, I can always rejoice in the Lord and the truth of his word. You know, when it says rejoice always and unconditionally, we confuse sometimes rejoicing and joy with happiness. And there's a difference. Happiness is often based on our circumstances. But joy is based on the eternal presence of the Holy Spirit and the eternal truths of God's word. So it doesn't matter in terms of uh, what happens here in this situation. I may not necessarily be happy about it, but I can still have joy. Uh, no one's happy that we have a pandemic that's affected so much of the world. But even in the midst of this situation, we can still have joy. We can still rejoice. We can still give glory and honor to God. So the, the present hardships we have does not affect that which is internal and eternal. And so we see the first thing that Paul says, rejoice continuously and unconditionally. And, you know, I just thought of some examples. For example, I've heard people say that, um, have you ever, someone ever been in a situation where, you have a position you hold, the job, you work years there, and you train other people who come and moved on beyond you. And you say, like, why am I passed over? I can't be happy in that, but you know what? I can still find joy in the Lord. Our coworkers that we have that work with, sometimes not having a, a, a very good relationship with them and talking about you, saying negative things and talking behind your back. No, I'm not happy about that, but you know what? I can still have joy. And even what you've experienced here, many people in our church have experienced having a medical diagnosis that really rocks you and it rocks your world. It, it, it just turns your world upside down and everything changes because of your medical condition. But even with that, there's still joy and rejoicing you can have because it doesn't shake who you are. It doesn't shake who you belong to. It doesn't shake the fact that God has called you and saved you out of darkness into his light. And in the future for you, there's a heaven waiting for you. And so we have these eternal things that are always with us so we can rejoice continuously and rejoice unconditionally. And Paul says that's a part of our pursuit of peace. But he also mentions here a second thing in our pursuit of peace is don't be anxious about anything. Okay? Uh, and we look at here in verse 6, it says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, that sounds easy, right? It's even simple words. Don't be anxious about anything. So I'm supposed to go through life like, you know, oh, fa la la, we have a pandemic, fa la 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 la, everything's fine. No, there are things in life that we have concerns about. There are things in life that we have to take a look at and deal with. Um, and, and that's a part of, of life itself. But when we, those concerns begin to grip us and they take hold of us to a point where we can't sleep to the point where we're consumed by them, to the point where we really allow those things to really affect us um, emotionally, then we know we're going from just having concern to really having anxieties or ang being anxious. And so we can't allow the things of the world that we have to deal with, and there are things that we have the problems that have to work out, things we have to face, we can't allow it to consume us to the point where it just overtakes us and overwhelms us. Um, and 1 Peter 5, 7 says this. It says, cast all your anxiety on him, 
because he cares for you. So, yeah, we have things in our life that really can cause concern for us. Uh, we have things that we have to uh, take a look at and deal with and problems we have to resolve. But we can't let those weights just be carried by ourselves. We have our Father in heaven who says, you know what, Bobby? I know what you're looking at. I know what you have to deal with. Whether it's your work situation, whether it's your personal life, whether it's your health situation, whether it's your financial situation. God says, I know. I know. I see it. But don't you let that to, to carry that anxiety upon you and yourself. Listen, I'm here. I'm your burden bearer. So I need you to take that particular weight and let me carry it. And, and I'll hold you and sustain you. And I know this doesn't change the situation. And our situation that we, that we may have to deal with may not necessarily change. But we have a God in heaven who we know has all power in his hands, who loves us unconditionally, who doesn't leave us or forsake us, we don't have to carry such a weight where we become that anxious. And so Paul can say the words, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be gripped and paralyzed by fear because of your circumstance. Uh, one thing I have heard and I realized that faith and fear cannot coincide together. Either you're going to walk in faith or you're going to walk in fear. And, and the Bible tells us God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And so, I, now I would love to say, you know what, <laughs> that I... Don't get anxious about anything. This week, I said, Lord, you know, I'm trying to preach this message on peace, and I have, like, no peace this week. Like, school is just driving me mad. I, I actually came home on Friday, and I told Pam, how are you doing, Bobby? I said, I just can't talk right now. I just, I just can't talk. Let me just put some music on, praise music, and we just talk. Fortunately, one of my brothers came over and, and, and prayed for me from my former church. Um, but you know what? There are times where we just have so many things that are just weighing on us, and we begin to carry that. And the Lord says, you don't have to carry all that. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I can help you. Cast your anxieties on me because I care for you. So when he says don't be anxious for anything, this is, I think, an unrealistic point that we don't have concerns. But don't let those concerns get to the point where they weigh us and begin to carry it to a point where we just uh, are down and downtrodden. All right? So rejoice unconditionally and continuously. Don't be anxious for anything. He tells us also in that same passage, pray about everything. Pray in everything. Once again, it says in verse 6, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Like, how many times do we have a situation in our lives where we look at it, we see it, and we do all we can first, and then we go to God afterwards, Right? I'm going to do this. i got it worked out. And I'm one of those people, you know what, I'm, I'm a person who likes to resolve situations, resolve problems. Say, okay, this happened. What's the plan? Let's solve it. You know what? Uh, often my wife gets tired of me because, you know, she's going to tell me something to be that, you know, that soundboard. I'm going to say, hey, you want to tell me something? Let's solve it. Okay, this is the situation. Let's, let's find a solution for it. And so it, 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 it's, it's, it's nerve-wracking when you aren't able to solve a situation. But he says in every situation, don't you just try to do what you think you should do. In every situation, Take it to the Lord in prayer. Every situation, whether it's big or small, he says at all times, bring these things before the Lord in prayer. Um, Paul also tells the church of Thessalonica the same thing. He says, you know what, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray continuously. Like, ongoing, late in prayer. But he also says, and Paul says to the church of Philippi as well, he says, not only do you just pray about it, not only do you just bring to the Lord that situation and, and, and cry out to him, about what's bothering you, what's, hev what's heavy in your heart, what's burdening you. But also do that same kind of prayer. Do it with thanksgiving. See, it's easy to come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know what? I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. But Lord, what am I thankful for? And so he gives us a word also, once again, in Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, says rejoice always, pray continually, which you said earlier, and give thanks in all circumstances. But this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. Rejoice always, which you mentioned earlier. Pray continually, which, which Paul says now. And then give thanks in all circumstances. In all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm dealing with, God says, you know what? Give thanks. Give thanks. Even though I know you have this petition, this situation, find the time, make the time to give thanks also as well. And I, I think, why is that such an important thing? Because when we give thanks to God, 
it helps us to kind of begin to shift our focus. Because we often see what we needs are and forget sometimes what we already have, what we can be grateful for, what we can be thankful for. Um, and it helps you also remember God's power and provision. You know, if, if I see the situation over here and I go back and thank God for what he did here and what he did here and what he's already given and what he's already done for me, it begins to remind me the God who I serve. And that situation that seems so big and so overwhelming begins to begin to come back into perspective. And so when I do this, it shifts my thinking, it shifts my perspective. And I begin to see how powerful my God really is when I begin to remember the things I could thank him for. Uh, I read a story about Matthew Henry. If you, if you ever have a Bible uh, commentary, uh, Matthew Henry's Bible commentary is a very famous one. And uh, Matthew Henry had a situation where he was robbed, right? And someone stole, I think, his wallet or someone stole something in his house. And Matthew Henry knew he had to be thankful at all times. And so they found this in his diary. There's something he wrote after him being robbed. He says this, let me f- be thankful first because I was never robbed before. So that's, I guess, the first time. Secondly, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, let me be thankful that although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. Like, Lord, this person gets so messed up, that could have been me. And so he found even that situation, what can I be thankful for? Even in an unpleasant situation, even in something that um, definitely is something I want to happen. And so pray in everything. And when we do pray, along with our petition, having that attitude of thankfulness. Because no matter what we're dealing with, what we're going through, there's always something we can be thankful for. There's always something we can be thankful for. And so he has that, and he says, so along with being rejoicing in their pursuit for peace, along with not being anxious about anything, along with praying in everything, meditate on the excellent and praiseworthy. So he tells us this in verse 8 and 9. I'm going to skip it down a little bit for a second. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You see, Paul tells them it's important what you focus on. It's important what you think about. And so we have to be intentional about where we direct our thinking and attention on, recognizing there is a battle for our mind. And so Paul tells them, listen, you got to be careful what you think about. you got to be careful what you put your focus on. And think of those things that are excellent or praiseworthy. These are the type of things to think on. If you want to have peace in the midst of chaos, if you want to have peace in the midst of sufferings, in the midst of hardships, be careful what you are thinking about. Be careful what you put your focus on. Be careful what you are meditating upon. Be careful what you intake ongoing. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 through 5 tells us this, that we fight not with weapons of the world, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Let me say this again. And we take captive every thought and make that thought obedient to Christ. Why is that? Well, Paul recognizes here, you know what, that for our mind there's a spiritual battle going on. And he says, I understand that the weapons that we fight with, they're not just weapons of the flesh, they're weapons of the spirit. And then we fight the weapons of the spirit. One of the greatest attacks we have in the spirit realm is in our minds. And even as believers in Christ who've been saved, who've been redeemed, there's a battle for our minds. All around us is a battle for our minds. We see it. We leave it. You literally breathe it. You can't walk down the street and not see there's something in our culture, in our society, that's trying to take and shape and warp our minds. So Paul also says in Romans 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, once your mind is renewed, then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That battle for our mind is a real battle. It's an ongoing struggle. Because Satan knows, you know what? Okay, you're saved, your soul is saved, you're going to heaven, but I can warp your mind. If I could twist your mind to think like the world, 
to be concerned with the world's more concerned with, to be consumed by the things of this society and this world, I can get you off of that heavenly perspective because I'm coming after your mind. And so it's important that we see there's a battle for our mind. And Paul recognizes, he says, make sure in that battle, meditate on those things that are excellent and those things that are praiseworthy. Uh, I found really interesting, um, a friend of mine shared with me a, a, a documentary on Netflix um, that really talks about how even in our culture and society and with social media, how there's so much, um, I will say even the manipulation for our minds and all about money. And so uh, this documentary is called The Social Dilemma. It goes on to talk about how they have these algorithms and these things in social media that literally are programmed to really try to anticipate what you like, what you don't like, and to and continuously feed you those things. Whether they're good for you or bad for you, they continue to just feed you and feed you and feed you. And the goal is to keep you always before the phone, always before the computer. Uh, their goal is to make sure that you are, are, are not focused on um, just uh, not the things we're saying of God, but that which kind of just feeds and keeps you on, on that particular social media. So if you ever look at Netflix, you have a Netflix account, look at the social dilemma. It'll really surprise you. And the thing about this was this. The people who develop these social media platforms are the very people who say, you know what, it's out of control. These aren't people from the outside who are just critics. These are people who are on the inside who develop these things and say, you know what, it just blossomed beyond what we thought it would. And so you know, be very careful that there's a battle going on to pull you. Uh, I, I remember in a part of the, uh, of the particular film, he talked about, I'm not sure if you guys remember a while ago, uh, if you're a basketball fan, uh, you know who Kyrie Irving is, right? Incredible basketball player, has gone to different teams, played with LeBron James for a while. And for a while, Kyrie Irving um, began to post that the earth was flat. Like, what? And this is a man, you know, college educated, went to school and so forth. He posted that the earth was flat. And he went in to describe it. You know what? I started watching these things on YouTube, and I saw these conspiracy theories. And he kept going and just went on this bunny trail. And it began to feed him what he thought he was looking for, to a point where he was convinced and said publicly, the earth is flat. And so it shows how things can be done just to kind of manipulate our mind and thinking. Um, now, and, and as I thought about that, I also thought about a situation that occurred um, just a few months ago. Uh, many of you know that um, I went to King's Academy, and I, I went from there from pre-K up until high school, right? And uh, I developed some really great friendships there. And so uh, there's a picture here of some friends I've, I met when I was in my eighth grade year. Um, and there's some people who just really made some really lifelong connections with. And we've been friends since like 13, 14 years old. I'm kind of 50-something now. So you're talking about 38, 40 years and so, right? I don't know if you see the high top fade was there or not. Um, and so these are friends I went to high school with and had a great relationships with, and we kind of kept in touch with each other. Um, and even as we got older, we, went, uh, we were part of each other's uh, historical moments of our lives where when I got married and some of them got married. So we also were part of weddings. Now, this wasn't my wife here, so I want to make sure you all straight. It wasn't my wife. This is my friend Kim and the others' friends, Kim, Susan, Dallas, Gloria. These are friends that we really grew up with um, for many years. So we've kept a good connection and relationship with ourselves um, for quite a while. And one of my friends here, um, Susan Wise, formerly Susan Beckman, the Wise family, uh, they keep in contact with me. Now, Susan and I, we fight all the time like brothers and sisters. I uh, love her to death and her husband, Mark, and her two kids there, uh, Kelsey and Jackson. And so... Uh, the Wise family, we kind of stayed in contact with each other and so forth. And actually, just like last year, they came and visited with us. And so our families got together. And um, we spent some time together just catching up. Uh, Jackson was finishing high school, getting ready to go to college. And uh, we just kind of, you know, connected together. And then about a couple months ago in October, I think it was October 2nd or 3rd, it was the same day we had our marriage conference here. Uh, I got a call from our other friend, Kim, who I wasn't married to. And she said, Bobby, I just got some bad news for you. I said, what is that? that Susan's youngest son, Jackson, took his life. And Jackson had just did his first year in college. He was just going through that. And he, when we met him, he was such a vibrant, vivacious, full of life young man. Um, talking, he loved me sharing stories about his mom in high school and how we, um, the things I used to do when we used to fight with each other and so forth. And, um, and so we got this call and there was no note found. His roommates found him um, in his bedroom. And it rocked me. And it rocked her. And this is something she's still dealing with. And people talked about him in terms of the fact that he was just the type of person when he, people met him, he would just pull things out of them and make them feel better about themselves. That's the kind of person he was. And 
he had some situation before earlier previously in high school that the, that the parents were aware of, and he had some suicidal thoughts. And they dealt with that, and they brought counseling for him and so forth. And it seemed like everything was fine for him. He seemed like he was just on top of the world. But yet something was going on with him that no one knew, that no one understood. And something he was just wrestling and gripped with that must have consumed that made him feel like it was better to end this life than to live it. And those around him who knew him were like, this is not the person. Like, of all people, this is not the person. This is the person who brought joy to everybody. And yet, what was he dealing with? What was his struggle? What was, what was consuming his mind, his thinking? They felt like this is the way for me not to deal with the pain I have. And then not too long ago, just actually last week, um, Amy shared with me that we had a, a person from our own church who used to be here in our children's ministry, took their life. Um, the family called her and told her uh, what happened. The young man, I think it was like between 14 or 16 years old, a teenager. And the question comes, what's consuming him? There's a battle for the minds. There's a battle for the minds of, of many people right now. And so many people are looking at sometimes the situation we're dealing with in society right now. Many people have struggles that they're looking at. And so we as the body of Christ, the believers of Christ, it's up to us to really show that peace that God really supplies. And it's up to us to make sure that we are becoming ambassadors of peace also as well. And it's also important that we recognize that no matter where we are whenever we're growing up, there's always a constant battle coming on within. The enemy's trying to take us out. And he's going to try to work on our minds. Um, myself as a leader in, in education, my boss, uh, Dr. Coleman, just had a discussion with many of us. says, listen, you guys got to make sure you watch, you're careful what you're taking yourselves in. You're the leaders of your school. If you begin to become distraught, if you to become um, disheartened, uh, then you're going to pass it on to those who are working under you. And she said, she used this word, she said, you be careful that you allow what happens to your psyche to not affect you. And she said, be careful what you take in. Be careful what you're receiving because that can kind of bring you down and affect others who are looking to you for support. And so it's important that we see in this pursuit of peace that we have to be very careful about those things that we can let come into our minds. And we got to make sure that we choose to focus. You may have to turn off CNN sometimes. You may have to turn off Fox News. You may have to put down social media. You may have to come off of, of Facebook for a while, YouTube, TikTok. You may have to come off some of those things over time period just to make sure that your mind is found the mind of Christ and not being shaped and molded by this world's system. And so meditate on the excellent and meditate on the praiseworthy is important in our pursuit of peace. And our last thing in the pursuit of peace is this, strive to live a righteous life. Paul says this in the latter part of that particular letter to the Philippians church in verse 9. He says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me and seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Put into practice how you see me live and this is also another part of receiving the peace of God. So one thing to take a look at is this. We can't just live the way we want to live and try to experience God's peace. You can't experience the peace of God not trying to walk in a way that pleases God. And so in Philippians 127 says this, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a life that's worthy of the gospel. Um, and when we say that, it's like, okay, so in order to have God's peace, I got to be perfect. In order to have God's peace, I got to, you know, be Mr. Mr. Right all the time. No, but we should be living a life striving towards righteousness. Um, if you look at uh, Philippians 3.14, well, another thing he says this, not that we have to be perfect, but we're growing and pressing forward, okay? We're growing and pressing forward. In Philippians 3, 12 to 14, it says this. Paul says, not that I've already attained all this, I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on. to Take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet as having taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and strange is what is ahead. I have pressed on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul says, listen, I'm striving. I'm not perfect. I've not arrived yet. 
I have a goal to move forward in the things of God, so I've not achieved it yet, but I'm determined. I'm determined. I'm going to compress my way till I get there. I'm going to live a life that's going to be pleasing to God. And so as us believers in Christ, we have to strive to live a righteous life as a part of us seeking God's peace. I can't just do what I want to do and ask God to grant me his peace. Obedience has to be a part of that. I cannot have the peace of God without having the obedience to God. And so we see here rejoicing continuously, not being anxious, praying in everything, meditating on the excellent and praiseworthy, and to strive to live a righteous life with Paul gives this Philippian church for them to pursue peace. And from that point, he describes the peace and gives some principles of peace that they should experience. And he says this back in verse 7, the peace of God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so, as we said earlier, the, the peace of God is promised to those who have peace with God. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want to have the peace of God, you have to have peace with God, which comes by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as the payment for our sins. And so, upon receiving that, and become, um, the fact that we know that we are secure in Christ and believers in Christ, we have access to God's peace. And when he describes the peace, it says the peace that surpasses all understanding. Like, I think of this as being like a crazy, nonsensical kind of peace. Um, I, I think, of, I think of, of the story of Jesus Christ um, when he, this is in Matthew 8, 23 to 27, when he has disciples to cross over this lake, and the storm comes, right? And so the disciples now, you got to remember, these disciples, many of them are fishermen. They're professional fishermen. They've been fishing all their lives, right? So they're not ones to exaggerate what they see. But the Bible points out the fact that they literally believe their lives are over. They literally believe that the boat's going to crash because of the storm, the wind, and the waves that are rising. Like, Lord, like, we're almost through. This is almost over, right? And so in the midst of this, this, this turmoil that's going on, this chaos, they're, they're, their nerves are wracked, and they think, you know, this could be it. And they look at Jesus. Like, wait a minute. Like, we see that our imminent danger or death is right ahead of us. What is Jesus doing? He's in a boat sleep. Now, how is it that we could be in the midst of seeing so much danger all around us, and yet he's right there in the boat sleep? And when they do come to him and say, Master, don't, don't, don't you care if we perish? What, 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 what's up with you? And he tells the wind and the waves, peace, be still. And like that, everything stops. And the disciples said, who is this man that the winds and the waves and the elements listen to him? See, he had a peace in a storm situation because he knew the power he had. He didn't have to fret and worry like anybody else had because he knew, I'm the God who created the seas. I'm the God who created the waves. I'm the God who has total control and total power. And so when we as believers in Christ begin to have that kind of faith in knowing who is this God that we serve, in a word, you say, peace, be still. And so we could be like him in the midst of a storm where everyone around us is acting crazy and like, what's going on? There's imminent danger. Things are just falling apart. We could be those people sleeping in the boat and say, now, I don't have the power, but I know the man who does. I know in the moment he could say three words, peace, be still, and this is done. So while you may be scrambling around, I'm going to walk in peace. Well, you may be having this, this, this turmoil going inside of you that won't allow you to sleep at night and, and waking you up. I can have peace because I know who's in the boat. I know the power he has. And that's the kind of peace I think of here when Paul says this peace is a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that when everyone else sees the situation from just a strictly earth, earth point of view, you see from a heavenly point of view. And I can walk in peace with that point of view. So we have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it says that peace, it'll guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The word here is like a, or it's like a, like a garrison, like a guard, like a, like a soldier who's standing guard and says, you know what? This is your heart. This is your mind. And I got you covered. And I'm guarding you and I'm shielding you. I'm shielding you from anything that can cause damage to your heart and to your mind. 
But once again, we have to make sure that we are choosing what we let into our, our minds and into our hearts. And so, like a soldier, that peace surrounds us and it protects us. But remember, God is a gentleman. If you want to stay focused on the things of the world and the culture, and you bring those in, it's hard to guard. Because we're opening up the doors. We're exposing our hearts. We're exposing our minds. The peace is there for us. We have to be intentional to walk in that peace. We have to make choices. We have to make things that we have to just put aside and say, you know what? I don't need to see that. I don't need to hear that. I don't need to be around that. I want to walk in the peace that God has for me. But he has it when we make those choices and things that we have to choose to make sure we receive that peace. And so it says in the last part of here, um, not only in verse 8, it talks about this peace that passes all understanding, but in verse 9 it says this, Whatever you have learned or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace. So the author and creator of peace, which is God himself, he says, I'm in your presence. I'm in your presence. I'm the creator of peace. I'm the one who has peace for you. And if you want to walk in peace, I'm with you. But you have to make sure you're making choices and pursuing the peace that I have for you. So in closing, I just want to share this real quick. I I know 2020 has been a challenging year for us. Um, And many of us kind of probably in and out of peace and anxiety throughout the year, to be honest with you. But we can choose to pursue the peace that God has for us by rejoicing unconditionally, by choosing not to be anxious about anything, by praying in everything and meditating on the excellent and praiseworthy and striving to live a life that's pleasing to God, a godly life. Um, One thing I know this time of year, uh, as we celebrate the year and and, and the holidays, for many people, my friend Susan and for many others, this would be a very difficult holiday season. There are hundreds of thousands of people who had loved ones who won't have them this year to celebrate. And that's hard. Um, And so even as we are celebrating ourselves and uh, sharing the holidays with our families and friends, be sensitive and be prayerful of those around us who many, many, many people are going through a very difficult time this holiday season. And let's be those instruments that seek to bring peace. Let's be those instruments that seek to uh, help people um, way through whatever challenge they may have to say, you know what, there's a God who loves you and there's peace available. You know, uh, it's a story of, of, of two painters who were in a contest to try to show a picture of what peace really looks like. Right? So one painter paints this just beautiful, serene mural, and he has the sun and some trees, and things are looking very pleasant, and it's a very uh, calm water, calm rivers as well, and that he has a picture of peace. And another painter draws a storm. He draws winds and clouds and, and the storm. Uh, almost like the picture you'll see of, of the Jesus of the disciples, lightning and thunder, all the things rolling ahead. And the picture shows waves crashing all around. And in the picture on the side, there's two rocks, and you have a bird on top of the rock who's singing and chirping. And it shows an example of what peace really is in a God's perspective. That even when everything around you seems chaotic, everything just seems in a turmoil, topsy-turvy, in the midst of a crazy chaotic situation, you can still have joy. You can still have peace. You can still sing glory and praises to your God, who you know has all power and all authority in his hands. And that's peace. That's peace that God gives where his tranquility overrules all your concerns and all your struggles. Amen? Amen. So here's the lessons to go home with. Um, just a couple of thoughts we share with you. One, happiness is often based on external circumstances, but joy is based on the internal presence of the Holy Spirit and the eternal truth of God's word. No matter what happens to us externally, there's some things that will never change. Who we are in Christ, what he's done for us, what he's providing for us. Um, it's not a happy, uh, happiness is based on situations, but that joy that we have, the rejoicing we can do is based on these eternal truths. Second thing is simply this, uh, concerted efforts for prayer that includes thanksgiving helps us to overcome being anxious. We have to be, make sure that we have a concentrated focus and emphasis on prayer. Um, 
it, it has to be something that we're intentional about. Um, and we have to make sure we include thanksgiving, things that we're thankful for. And those helps us overcome being anxious. A third thing is this. We have to be intentional about where we direct our thinking and attention on. Recognizing the spiritual battle for the mind. Like, there is some serious things going on in terms of the heavenly realms and the spiritual realms. So we have to make sure that we're aware that we have to focus our attention, focus our thinking, those things that are excellent and praiseworthy. So we don't get pulled into the system of this world. And the last thing is something like this. God's a place for his children, a place of peace in any circumstance. But we must pursue it. We must pursue it. We must make choices and decisions that, God, you have peace available for me. Am I choosing to do the things to walk into that peace? Amen? Amen. Let's pray.